six, seven, eight people in total in the house, sometimes join in for, for just one project who, who comes and overlaps with, with us. Um, and we mostly work for Spiegel Online, sometimes for the print magazine as well. And uh, what we do is data journalism, and since it's such a big discussion and no one really knows what it is, that's my first slide. What's data journalism at all? Um, so data journalism is kind of an evolving field in journalism. It started, um, you could say, five, six, seven years ago, it became a bigger thing. And back then, data journalism looked like this. So this is an example of The Guardian in 2011. Um, and I subtitled it or titled it with fancy maps and data dashboards. That's actually what people did back then, or meant back then when they were talking about data journalism. So they just they found out there's some new open data, some new data sets, they threw it on a map or on a dashboard, um, put a headline on it, and let people explore and play with the data. So that's one way of making data public, but is that journalism? I mean, there's no article, there is uh, no explanation. There's uh, here, these are two variables and there's something about correlation, but it's not really explained what's happening there and what not. And, uh, so this is how it got started. People got these new tools, in this case it's Tableau. Um, they put this content online um, and uh, no offense, The Guardian was really good back then and they paved the way for a lot of what we are doing today. Uh, but data journalism looked a lot different back then. So it was these data dashboards and when I say fancy maps, those were the, the stories where you got a beautifully animated map with which just serves like one purpose. Uh, how, where, where people are moving, where people are coming from, where people are, uh, what age, these kind of things. So, things that you find in the Atlas normally. Uh, that's what, what everybody uh, did back then. Um, I'd say nowadays, data journalism is something, uh, something different. Um, this is one definition which I really like. As a uh, journalism professor who says, uh, data journalism is, so, is social science done on deadline. Um, this applies, for example, for what 538 does. Uh, I assume pretty much everyone knows 538 here, right? No. Yeah. So no. the stats. Okay, I did the stats guys at the New York Times, you could say, um, led by Matt Silver, who uh, done reporting on the potential outcomes of presidential elections for years and years now. And uh, through the election or before the election 2016, they had this one purpose site. Uh, you could say not, not one purpose site, but they're, they're big. A big part of their homepage with the current predictions for the, the election, with uh, including every single poll, building building models, showing maps of the likely, likeliness of one state form to Democrats or Republicans, um, and much, much more. So this whole uh, big big dashboard as well, but it did a lot of reporting as well. Um, so what they did is, yeah, so the science down the deadline. So every day, every day, live, all the time, there's a new poll, they've got a new figures, they've got a new predictions of what's going to happen, what's not going to happen. Um, and I'd say data journalism is much more, much more now. Uh, this story is a good, a good example. Um, it's much too small to actually can, uh, read it here. Um, uh, I'll explain it to you quick, quickly. It's by BuzzFeed from last year. And it's like, the, the, I'd say, the newest step of data journalism, because what, what they did in this story here um, is finding out which planes uh, might be chartered or hired by the U.S. Army or uh, by public uh, by the, by the public, public companies uh, to monitor border regions or just to do surveillance. How did they do it? Uh, they just took data sets they had from surveillance planes, uh, looked at the at the, at the classified them as surveillance planes by the by the, uh, by the kind of track they had, and then they took flight 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 radar, I think, data of millions and millions of flights, and then they just applied some machine learning and found out, okay, with these few million uh, flights we've got, what those here potentially looking like surveillance so so flights, and then they had. Um, they had a story, and they investigated it, and they, they found some shady businesses and everything. Um, so actually, it all started just with the data set, and they applied some statistics and machine learning, and in the end, they got a big story. So that's the step where data journalism is now, or some of it, at least. And uh, on this long uh, journey, I'd say, um, if you're talking about what's data journalism, um, if you want it to be the latter, so if you want it to be social, social, science, social science down on deadline and much more, then we have to structure our workflows accordingly. Uh, we don't have to, to work for, for uh, like publishing one dashboard, but we have to adjust our workflow so that, that we can uh, really produce it on this level. Um, and this means looking at science and at workflows that apply there and use them for journalism and stuff. Um, 
that's actually a, pro a process we are currently in, in our team. Um, we just now, we have to find a folder structure for every project we start. Um, so we, we, we've got a reliable uh, structure which helps, helps us organize ourselves. Um, typically our projects are very fast, so they last from a few hours, a few days to maybe a few weeks. So not a big science project which lasts much longer, but you have more time to structure everything. But we need to be fast and we need to document our stuff as well, so I have someone else who's who's uh, looking into what I produce, understands what I produce, um, and it has to be uh, reliable, it has to be accurate. Um, so that's a big challenge. Um, the, the structure we currently um, built for us looks like, looks like this. I'm going to go through it just briefly. Uh, we've got this folder structure with some, like one, one folder with the article, where in the end we've got all the text and all the, the drafts we write during our process. Uh, we've got a data folder. But we've got one subfolder with raw data. There's nothing in there but raw data unchanged, it's just to, to make sure we save it somewhere and we don't override it. Pretty, yeah, basic, but it makes sense. And we've got a folder called process, where we have process data, which uh, yeah, it's processed sometime, and we got final data, the final results of our processing uh, workflow. Um, to process the whole data, I'm going to make, make a step. It's uh, over there, it's the, the scripts folder. We've got our scripts, we work in different scripting languages, most of which. Uh, is either Python or R. Uh, so we got some scripts who take the raw data, do some processing, and produce the final um, data. And uh, we've got some, some more conventions, like uh, we've got some, uh, some local copies of either the used code snippers or even self written libraries, which go in this folder here. We've got reports, we've got random HTML files. I don't kind of come to that, what, uh, what uh, notebooks actually are, that's where you find them. Um, and most important, probably we get a readme file which we now write a markdown, is what we see here. Um, so when someone opens up this project, he's going to always see um, what's it about, uh, what's the current status, who wrote it, um, what's in there, uh, which are the resources, um, how can, can, can I reuse the data, and in the end, uh, where do I find a published article or figures or whatever, whatever we produce. So that's how we keep everything together in this structure, um, which is still working for us. Um, yeah, and now I'm going to show some examples on how we use R and more specifically R notebooks uh, during our workflow. Um, I think I'm going to just jump right in there. It's probably better to explain than to use the, the, the slides. Um, so uh, let's jump to R. Who, who knows R notebooks, by the way? Just, just a few, four of you. Okay, so I'm going to say take a little time to explain the concept. Uh, I've got some examples which, are, which I'll share with you as well. And they're, they're going to be fun, but they are okay already. Um, this is what an R notebook looks like if you open it or if you write it in R, in R Studio. Uh, an R notebook is uh, the combination of, uh, of Markdown. So you see uh, Markdown written here, uh, with, which is uh, with some additional CSS styling. Um, those, those are the areas where you write, where you write, write markdown and you got code chunks where you can write R code, you could even write uh, bash code or you could write Python code uh, as well in this area, but it's something different. Um, and what you use it for is basically keeping everything together. Um, so in this example we've got, um, we've got uh, chunks of code which, which you see in the gray areas and in between, uh, let me see, probably not the best to best uh, example to, to show the whole logic. And in between you got, um, here it's just a comment, um, you got the explanations. Um, so that's where you produce your notebooks actually, but what they are really used for is in the end if you, if you publish them, if you render them to HTML, then this whole notebook is going to look like this. So this is an HTML file, the rendered version of the notebook. Um, so if you run the whole notebook, the whole, all the code chunks in there, um, they get rendered. Um, this means that you've got your headlines and your text areas, and then you've got the output of different code chunks, which could be tables or figures or whatever. Um, and you've got the code included there as well. And you can either decide if you want to show or if you want to hide the code. In this case, I've hidden it because it's, this is the workbook I'd give to another editor to, to read through my, through my analysis without having to read all the, the data, uh, random stuff I, I did on the way. But I could, uh, I could uh, just open it up and you see what I do there, you see the libraries I've, I've uh, loaded, you see the configura configuration for my notebook, and then you see how I started with, yeah, this is a function to, to hide my scraper I, I was building for this, um, for this uh, application for, for what I was doing there. 
Um, and if I, if I hide it again, then you can see how I, what, I, what I'm doing there actually is like uh, posing questions and answering them for an editor. Um, so let's talk about the topic, what's the topic here. Um, what we were doing there is uh, analyz analyzing uh, how the transfer market in football was evolving. Everybody in the summer was discussing about the, the insane uh, figures, the, the hundreds of millions uh, clubs are now paying for football uh, players. And we were asking ourselves, is this really insane or is it uh, rational? Uh, is, it, uh, is it backed by money that's in the market or not? And so we just looked into it. What, what I started with uh, was uh, going to <coughs> ScanRD, which is pretty much a standard source for getting large amounts of data for this, uh, for this uh, topic. I've got a URL up there, so you see if you want to have all transfers between clubs, you can just structure your URL by um, iterating uh, through the seasons here, uh, through the leaks uh, in this area, um, and move from page to page and uh, scrape the content. Um, scraping means, in this case, just creating the table here, keeping the name, keeping the amount <coughs> paid for a player, these kind of things, uh, which is done in a simple R code actually. Um, and then, as soon as you've got uh, all this, all this uh, data, uh, we, do, we start with some data sanitizing. So we, we check uh, the number of transfers per league. Um, they are pretty much on the same level, so this looks, looks good. Um, we're looking, looking at uh, how many, yeah, how many um, players leave a club per year as one figure. Um, we're looking at here over time. Figure, uh, Amount of the count of transfers per year. Um, the ten most uh, most expensive transfers of all time, just to make sure we are everything is all right. And those are the, the big names and the numbers you'd expect. So we see, okay, our scraper and our data pro data collection is working out. Um, then we are looking at uh, the hypothesis we had that the amount is going up and up, and that's actually what we see. You have the simple plot of the total amount of money which, which is transferred between the clubs of the big five leagues uh, in Europe uh, in the summer only. And now we are at, a, at around 5 billion euros which are transferred between these clubs in one summer. Um, so that's what we, what we do there, and we continue and have some. Um, some more data sanita sanitation and the first the first uh, uh, plots you could later on use for an article to explain actually what, what's happening in the market. And uh, at one point we had uh, the idea, um, this was starting here, that what we see is actually some kind of, you could say, football inflation. So we've got uh, inflation in money, not the normal inflation, uh, but an inflation in the football market. Um, and my approach, or I've, I've seen it on the football stats blog, and I adopted the idea, um, was to look at how much money is actually in, in the market. Like take the total number, the to total amount transferred between clubs for one year, um, and <coughs> go from year to year and look how much does this money, um, how, much, how much does it get uh, get bigger the amount of money. So calculate the inflation uh, in the football market, um, and then use this inflation calculation to find out players from like the 2000s, early 2000s, how much would they, would they be worth today? Um, that's what football fans would be interested in, for example. And this is what it looks like. So if you, um, if you do the math, then you got uh, Neymar, who's still the most, uh, most expensive player in the world, 222 million this summer. And that, then you got position number two, Rio Ferdinand, actually, uh, defender, Manchester United, who um, cost 46 million back in 2002, but in 2002 there was so much less money in the market that if you adjusted for inflation today you, you would transfer for 202 million. So that was our uh, our approach to uh, to find out who was really the most expensive player of all time, and it's still Neymar. So it wasn't good for the headline. It would have been more fun if you could have said Rio Ferdinand is the most expensive player of all time, but he wasn't. Um, so that's the fun side about it. And the serious side about it is um, that we now can say um, what's happening, in, what the figures we see, they, they sound insane, but actually the whole amount of money in the market is getting bigger and bigger, and the money is actually there, so it's not like a big bubble, um, it's, it's, it's growing and growing, but it's backed by money that's actually there. Um, and if you, if you could go on, um, that's, I think this figure here in the end, um, where does the money come from? Uh, this is the money coming from the TV market. So this is the income side for the clubs. 
uh, the money uh, the clubs make, and uh, they make millions and billions of to television uh, licenses. So in the end, uh, all the football fans are paying more and more money to see the to see the players play, and the, who, who earns the money is the the players with their contracts, and it's the um, the managers who arrange the transfers. So that's how we how in the end we, we told the story um, that evolves from the data actually. Um, in the end, it's just an, an ordinary article, you could say, uh, which looks like this. So you get like, uh, one big picture and you start, and you get uh, ordinary text. We get these figures we've produced, or we, we produced the, the data for it in R. In the end, we, we publish them with different tools, because they are JavaScript and have to work with our content management system on the side. Um, if you get this table you've seen in R already, so I could present the, the pre preliminary results to uh, sports editors and discuss them with them, and rebuild something. Uh, similar for our homepage, uh, which actually is uh, um, has a search function. Uh, so I could say I only want to see the players playing for Borussia Dortmund, and they only get the transfers for this one team that interests me the most. Um, and yeah, <coughs> um, but let's switch back to the presentation. Um, I was talking a lot about the topic now, not so much about the tools. Actually, for scraping, we use RVest, uh, which is my tool of choice for scraping. Um, if you don't know it and want to scrape data, take a look at it. Uh, data processing is done with the Tidyverse packages. That's a, like a big collection of tools. I can, I can show some of the Tidyverse stuff in uh, the next uh, example I got. Um, exploratory data this is, is ggplots. Uh, that's what we use mostly. And we use the notebooks to communicate with our editors to show them the results we've got, because they don't know how to play with the data and then do that in this part. Um, we export the data for the charts and interactives. And very important as well, uh, we need this whole workflow to be reliant because we want to update it really quickly. The transfer market in Germany closes at the, third, at the, at the last of, uh, of August. So we knew we want to publish the story on the 1st of September. Um, I could prepare everything ahead and I just had to rerun my notebook with all the code chunks in there and within minutes I had to do data, could update the charts in the article, everything was ready. So that's why we're using this approach, actually, to be ready to update your stuff and uh, be ready to publish quite, uh, quite soon after. Um, that's one example. The, the second one I've got is uh, from the federal election last year. Um, and just. Just uh, like the last time, I'm going to jump right into it. Um, this uh, looks like this, and actually, it's a real life example. So, it's no, um, not a notebook I've cleaned up and uh, comment, put comments in there for publication. It's just the way I built it, and I didn't have much time for it, so it was done like in a day or one and a half, and it's not very clean. And some parts of the text are in German, and probably they won't run on your machine because you don't have the package I have. But it was not made for republication, it was made to, uh, to actually serve a purpose. And the purpose in this case um, was, uh, I don't see the whole picture here, uh, was to, to find, uh, find insights about the social demography of, uh, of voters uh, in different parties during the federal election. Um, and um, I gotta go to the rendered version, it's easier, just easier to present. Um, this is what the rendered version looks like. Uh, so we started with. Oh, it's cut up. Wait a second. Ah, there. Yes. Got a different aspect ratio and presentation. There you go. Um, so you get the overview on the side, and then that's what we started with. We wanted to know, or um, in German, we wanted to know. Uh, which, which group in the population voted for Merkel, which group voted for Schulz. Um, we wanted to know which party lost um, uh, in certain, in certain uh, groups and which party won, how they did compared between 2013 and 2017. Um, and we used data from the Federal Election Commission, uh, which tells us uh, not, not only the, the results um, in, each, uh, in each area, but also the social structure there. Um, and just to give an editor uh, an uh, idea of what we've got here, uh, those are all the variables actually we've got for every single for every uh, single single constituency. Uh, so we've got something like the number of population, we've got uh, uh, the age groups, we've got income, we've got um, all these variables here. So just to get an impression, 
And then we're starting uh, with different uh, plots and different types of visualizations. How could we actually present um, present uh, the, yeah, how, how demography and uh, everything relates to the prediction results. Um, and this is just really quick we're working and publishing different kind of visualizations. We wanted to do something different, something that's intuitively readable. Um, and uh, you have you see it on the left what we did the environment plots and density plots and whatnot. So these are different visualizations. Um, good unfold here and you see how easy to code this we actually use there. So we've got some, some colors which are all party colors of Spiegel Online. And then this here is the is the, the tidyverse uh, approach. So we've got this it's called a pipe here. So this symbol actually takes the input from one uh, function and pipes it into the next function. Um, not the best example because we've only got one step here. The others may get one one uh, function, one line all the time. That's how it works. Um, so we take the, the the data I've got at this point, uh, type it into a GG plot to plot the data, and I'm plotting a violin plot here. Um, violin plot is uh, for those areas in which um, for 2000. 13 data, the CDU or CSU were stronger than the SPD in black, in those areas where the SPD was stronger in red. Um, so, plotting, so separating the two data sets and uh, plotting it against uh, unemployment in this case. And you see that the areas in which the, the conservatives won in 2013, uh, they had most of the time a much lower uh, unemployment rate than the areas in which the uh, which SPD won. So this is was one, one kind of uh, analyzing or visualizing this. Um, different way would be to just use a density plot, um, or you could use this kind of dot plot, um, or you could do a combination of a density plot and a crazy random plot, I don't even know how to pronounce it in English, um, or you could do a joy plot, uh, or ridge line plots, how they are called now, which is just another way of density curve. Um, so these are all different ways of visualizing um, the, the, the results of SPD and CDU in the areas that they want. Um, until we then, at some point, uh, I thought, yeah, I have to take care of how many how many uh, constituency constituencies uh, constituent. How's it called? <laughs> Voting areas. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, were won by the SPD and how many by the, by the CDU, CSU, and then you see, okay, 35 in 2013 is the number where the SPD actually was stronger. And I think it's pretty skewed, so probably that's not the best idea to, uh, to use this kind of visualizations. And we, we switched our approach and we did something different. And that's in the end what we published as well. So we've uh, developed this approach here. Uh, I think that's for the age groups. Uh, this here is better. Um, this is for the uh, for the unemployment as well. So our approach in the end was taking uh, those out of the 300 areas we have in Germany, taking those 25 percent where one party was, was had its strongest result, um, and that's, um, where the, the union uh, uh, CDU. CDU, CSU had a strongest results and their strongholds typically, typically have a very low uh, unemployment rate. And those areas where uh, the left, as on the contrary, have their party strongholds, we've, had, we've got high unemployment rates. So we get this correlation um, between those, uh, those factors and the party. Um, that's what we, what we developed. We tested with different, um, different variables. Um, we tried out uh, how it looks like if you if you if you split the vote in half, so take the take fifty percent where the take define party strongholds as, as those fifty percent where a party had its strongest result, or if you go for thirty three percent or twenty five percent, so you take in different threshold levels. Um, and also you see here that the style is like already looking more than what like what, something we published in the end. Um, that's what we develop step by step, and there are some some more ideas I think down there which are just yeah we were just trying out and in the end they didn't work because they were not readable. I don't want to go through it and explain everything we did, but it's like the, the whole collection we produced in a day or one and a half, and to, to find uh, an approach that actually works. 
Um, and in the end, we, we went for this approach. Um, so that's the article that we published. Um, and uh, with that one, one big uh, image at the top, and we put in some annotations as well to explain more thoroughly how this works, actually, because the plots are not that easy to read, we have to admit. Um, and then if you scroll down, you've got yeah, like the different variables we, uh, we used, uh, income, and um, we used again, uh, unemployment rate, um, the percentage of uh, foreigners, um, and also we did these comparisons between uh, the current election and the last election, which were really interesting. So if you take the AFD, uh, 2017 and 2013, then you see, uh, cut it against the, um, the share of uh, immigrants or foreigners. Then you see 2013, the AFP was a party which had its party strongholds and supports everywhere. They still were back then, they were Eurosceptic. They were not the party they are nowadays. So this is the distribution they had in 2013. And now 2017, their party strongholds are in the areas where they have the lowest uh, amount. Lowest, the lowest share of immigrants, all of the party strongholds are now in eastern Germany where you get traditionally low, uh, low, um, low, low number of immigrants and you can see how the party strongholds and how the profile of the party has well shifted if you compare those two, um, those two elections against each other. But all in a very visual way, not using advanced stats and confronting people with things they probably won't understand, but yeah, going for a visual approach. Um, yeah, what, what did I use? Um, again, data processing with the tidyverse, which probably is a topic for another talk. Um, exploratory, exploratory data versus Chichi plot and two more packages, Chichi B swarm and Chichi ridges, which are used for these plots here, um, for example. Um, then the notebook was used for communicating with my text editors to, to show them our, our, our preliminary results. Uh, exporting final figures with ggblot as well. In this case, this was really the final figures, so the one we put on the home page where static images uh, exported with ggblot. Um, and we entirely prepared before election night. Um, everything was ready and we just had to um, update, uh, run the code and we had the final election results and within minutes we had the plus. Uh, it still took hours and hours to publish uh, it because we still had to write an article. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but that's what we do. Um, I've got a third example, but it would take too long to go uh, through it. I'm just going to stay with the chart here. Um, you're going to find this one and the other ones as well. I published them with the, the link in this presentation. Um, this is about measuring rental housing discrimination in Germany, um, a large project of ours. Uh, I won't go into detail. Um, but we collected data ourselves in this case, and we had to do quite some statistical tests and modeling and all the things where you know much more about than I do. Um, and we used our notebook in this case to, uh, as well to, uh, to show our results and to communicate them um, inside our house and uh, also with editors from different departments. Because this was a study we did uh, in collaboration with the Bayerische Rundfunk, um, a public broadcasting company, and they are connected with so many different uh, departments from, uh, from radio, from television, uh, we in our house with the Spiegel, the print version, the Spiegel online website. Uh, you got so many different editors you talk to, to publish your articles in the end, uh, who don't know anything about the methodology and about the pitfalls. So we need some, some place where you can communicate it, where you can actually explain something and even tell people if you if you ex if you take exactly this approach or if you formulate it this way then it's, it's right but be careful and be careful if you just pick one value because it might not be significant so we're doing these kind of, of things uh, inside a notebook to communicate it um, and in the end also we used uh, we used uh, github and the rendered notebook or notebook in general to, to publish uh, what we've uh, what we've done um, this is like the, I'd say the, the gold standard for data journalism projects. If you're, if you're really good at what you do, and if you uh, got the time to document everything, um, and you wanna wanna improve your your credibility, uh, by don't just publish it every, uh, everything in the end. So the same approach you get with open science. Uh, you're publishing your data sets, you're publishing your methodology, and your explications and everything together. And that's what we did there. And then you find on GitHub the data set you can. You can uh, download the notebook and you can rerun the code and see step by step what's actually happen happening in there. You can find errors if, you, if there are any, I hope there are none. 
uh, you can start a discussion with us or the one who published it and say, okay, I don't trust you at this point because I would have done this differently. Um, and that's in the end, if you if you're working on a bigger project and if you uh, if you need a um, uh, if you want to improve transparency, uh, it's a good way to do it. Uh, so are you there, just a very quick question. Are you saying there are links um, typically from the Spiegel Online uh, website to your GitHub uh, data set and so on? Um, actually, we at Spiegel Online we still have to get a lot better at that. Actually, we only did it for one or two projects. Uh, others, other news outlets do this on a more regular basis already. Um, but if we do it, uh, we've got the, like the small version would be to have an FAQ uh, box inside the article, which is just where does the data come from, what do we have, do we have to know about, are there any pitfalls, so like answering just the small, simple questions, that's what what's everyone's doing all the time now. Um, and the bigger version, publishing everything on GitHub, uh, you would actually link out of Spiegel Online to GitHub. You get your portfolio. Like the, the colleagues in uh, the Swiss radio and television, they've got one big GitHub page which, where they feature their last 15 or 20 data journalism projects, uh, all in one repository, each, each a project in one repository with a thorough documentation and everything, reproducible. Um, so that's where you would go if you had a lot of time and if you do it thoroughly. <coughs> Yeah, to sum things up, uh, why using R notebooks in this approach? Um, by the way, Python and Jupyter notebooks is also great for those folks who use Python. Uh, pretty much the same in, in the end, at least for, for what we are doing. Um, for us, uh, solving problems with code or coding forces us to be accurate. Um, so we work fast and it's much easier to do it to have this, this one-off solution, uh, which you do in a graphical user interface, um, but if you want to be if you want it to be reliable and you want it to be accurate, show actually is good and helps you to, to do it step by step and to really follow what you're doing. Um, then we've got um, sorry, uh, we've got scripting allows us to prepare ahead and update our analysis. We've seen that in the, the two examples. So we can do the stuff up front. If you've got a deadline, we prepare everything and we can update it in the election night, for example, and got everything ready. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do such things on a deadline if we didn't prepare ahead. Um, then we've got rendered notebooks, which are uh, really great for, dis for discussing, discussing our results um, with the not so tech savvy colleagues who don't understand the code, who don't want to see the code, they actually just want to see the output. Um, and we don't want to separate output and analysis because um, we want to have everything in one place. Our workflows are iterative, so we have to start over and over again. We've got new questions, we've got new data coming in, um, and everything is entangled together. Um, especially analysis and reporting. You, if you're in the reporting phase and you find out something, you should have to go back to the data set and find out there and take another look at. Um, this is why you want to keep everything in one place and uh, have this one document to just rerun, one area you could just adjust. And you don't want to go back to three or four different tools and have a long chain of uh, things you do afterwards, prepare your data to, to get it out of the your working environment and through the next tool. Um, that's if keeping everything in one place is actually the biggest advantage of using notebooks for our work. Um, and I think that's it. I think you have time for questions and you got the slides and uh, one demo notebook, my um, GitHub account.